Thank you, Ben. Hi, everyone. I, you are one of the few folks in the whole world who are so committed to OVS and OVN and DPDK that you are sacrificing a bright, sunny Friday afternoon to be here. So round of applause to all of you. <laughs> I really hope I'm not a disappointment for this afternoon. I'll try to make it as lively as possible. So how many people are in the audience who are not part of a silicon company? Who are not part of a silicon company? OK. <laughs> no pressure. OK. How many people are here just because there was not a good connection back home this afternoon? Brutal honesty. Yeah, one, OK. Andy's honest. I'm very sure there are others like that. So <clears throat> the reason for me saying that is that, yes, it is difficult. And Friday afternoons for travel is difficult. And we heard on the radio yesterday that apparently today is the new most travel day of the year, uh, because a lot of schools get the whole week off, or a lot of children take a whole week off next week. So thank you for being here. And I think more people will trickle in from lunch. So without further ado, let me start. So the reason for my talk really is, um, first of all, acknowledgments first. This is what I'm presenting is not my work. I'm what the MBAs of the world and the accountants of the world call overhead. Like, I don't do any work, but I'm just <laughs> one of the managers who takes credit for others' works. But I don't want to be the manager who takes the other's credit, credit for others' work. So I want to first start with, like, uh, shout out to all these people that I'm presenting their work from. So most of them should be, uh, you should know many of them. The second one is the disclaimer that I was, uh, that I wanted to put, but I was also forced to put, that we are Red Hat, we love everybody who works with open source. Wide arms. Every silicon vendor, every protocol guy, every software provider, every ISV, every cloud provider, everybody, we are Red Hat. Big group hug. So all the silicon vendors are equal to us. The numbers, the slides that I'm going to show, please view them at a macro level. Meaning don't focus on, oh, 64 byte, that guy is better than the other. No, no, no. Please don't compare my numbers with and against any vendors. All vendors have different solutions. All of them are great solutions. Uh, I'm trying to be as politically correct as possible here, as you can see, and I'm struggling with it. But anyhow. But <laughs> But uh, seriously, on a serious note, there's a lot of tremendous work that has been done in the last 12 months. And we really appreciate all of that. All our vendors are equal partners for us. And these numbers that I'm going to show are from our own testing. For actual numbers and real uh, test case scenarios, et cetera, use cases, please refer to the vendors themselves, hardware vendors, and they will provide you the correct numbers. So why, with all of that disclaimer and lawyer talk behind us, now let me be frank. <laughs> the reason I wanted to do this was to really show an independent view of where we stand with hardware offload. Does it look promising? Why offload? Why does it look promising? What's left to do? And then I have some backup slides. So the work is definitely not done. Um, and there were other, my colleagues here in the audience, they did really a lot of groundwork for my presentation yesterday. So I highly encourage you to please listen to or look at the recording from Frank's presentation from yesterday at 11 and Aaron's presentation from uh, Thursday, yesterday at 3.30. So especially if you are viewing, you weren't here yesterday or you are watching this offline, please watch those first because that will give you more of a background of what I'm going to talk about. So why not just software? Why not just software? That's the eternal question. Why not just software? Intel chips, motherboards, CPUs, honking, C honking CPUs, motherboards. That's all great. Enough memory. More silicon for everybody. Why not just do it in software? Well, it just simply needs too many cores. That's the simple answer. And I'm very sure the silicon vendors will tell you all about it. So we have it solved, or we have it working. And uh, as Frank mentioned, in some places, we have it even up and running live on the uh, critical path. But that is only for 10G. So 4 million packets per second per core, yes, even with DPDK. That takes care of 
like 4 million packets. It's, for 10G, it should be 14.4 for comparison. So it's one third per core. So you need at least two, or I have further math. But it just doesn't scale to 25G, 40G, 100G. So that's why no software. So this is a complete cut and paste from Frank's slides. This is a picture of even with DPDK, OVS DPDK, all those virtual, uh, virtual switches, um, I'm sorry, vCPUs, the setup, et cetera. Again, please, if you want further explanation, look at Frank's slide. He has better understanding, I mean, better information about that. So coming back for a second. This 4 million packets per second is just packet forwarding. Like there is no extra effort on it. There's no extra sauce. This is just forwarding to a virtual machine and coming back. Now, there was last year or the year before, I forget, there was a lot of questions about, oh, OVS DPDK or OVS in general, we can't do zero packet loss. So all the telcos were poo-pooing it, saying, you, uh, there's no zero packet loss. I mean, there's so much loss in there. And it can't be done on software. So we said, sure. We took on that challenge. We worked with a lot of smart people. And yes, we can do zero packet loss with OVS DPDK. This is the diagram. It's more information. It's an eye chart at the bottom. But as you can see, um, first of all, what does zero mean? It does zero mean 20 packets per million, five, one, zero. But as you are, do care about this, these numbers and zero packet loss for telcos and tele television transmissions and all of that, it starts to become very, very, very challenging. And it needs an expert level system tuning to get these numbers. It is possible. But if you look at like zero, really zero packet loss per million, zero per million, then you, you are already seeing 64 byte packets. The throughput is only 2.17 million packets per second. It is possible but it's getting challenging. And if you add QoS or you add, I, of course, you add IPsec and it goes phew, in kilobits, maybe not kilobits, but I'm exaggerating, but it goes way down. But any other action other than forwarding that you do, numbers go down. Ronnie talked about it, other people talk about it, they will talk about it, so it's all clear. But with software only, it is becoming challenging even for 10G. It's possible, but challenging. So what's the big deal? Just add more CPUs. <laughs> What's the big deal? Intel's going to come out with another chip. ARM is, has 64 byte. Uh, Red Hat works on ARM 64 bit. No problem, just add more CPUs. Sure. Um, so if forwarding 10G of traffic, like full 10G termination takes four cores, and if storage takes another two cores, that's six out of 24. That's one fourth of a chip, one fourth of the core. Yeah. And that is wasted revenue for a cloud provider because they are not running the application. They are not running your, the, the kiosk. They're not running the travel application on it. They are not giving it away because that core is being used for just terminating traffic, network traffic and storage. So that's wasted revenue for the cloud providers because they charge, they charge per cycle per second. And we learned it the hard way because in one of our older releases, Network Manager, which was talked about earlier, that just used to remain on in the background, making sure that there are no DHCP requests, et cetera. And that was a non-starter for cloud guys, because they said, oh, this runs in the background, but it chews cycles. So we made it more a la carte and more nimble that in server environment, it doesn't have to do that. But we found out that they are really literally charging per cycle per second. So let me start to get to the crux of the matter. That was the foundation. So as, as you know, as software matures, as protocols mature, as RFCs mature, the hardware vendors and the silicon guys start putting that stuff into silicon. So that is where we are at now. So for the last 100 years to the last 10 years, it was all hardware. You know, Imagine those ladies putting the switches, et cetera. That was all hardware. Cisco, Juniper, they made tons of money truckloads of money selling custom hardware. I was in uh, Siemens, part of a 320 million euro project for 40,000 calls gateway, media gateway. So it was all hardware, custom hardware, custom software. Then came Niceria, VMware, others, Intel themselves, DPDK. Last 10 years, it's like all software. We can do it on software. We don't need custom hardware. That changed the whole dynamic, very disruptive technology. But now the pendulum is shifting towards somewhere in the middle. Very near future, some hardware, some software. That's what my belief is. OK. So it's not all doom and gloom. There are many vendors. Like this whole day, I see talk after talk after talk 
about OVS offload solutions, Netrono, Mellanox, Cavium, Chelsea, Broadcom, and many others. If you are in the others category, please talk to me. We want to get you out of the others category into the main page. So please talk to us. Shameless plug. We want to work with you to get you out of the stealth mode and get you on this board so that we can say, yeah, it's integrated with Red Hat, et cetera, et cetera. So many hardware solutions, many hardware vendors have obvious uh, offload solutions, which is great. So big shout out to all the silicon providers, really big shout out, because it hardly ever happens. There's a lot of collaboration upstream uh, between them on the software side. I want to give credit to Ronnie, but maybe it's not his term, it's somebody else's term. But what they've been doing is saying, let's compete on the silicon and the boards and keep the software the same. And that is, uh, that's great. That, is, that needed a lot of collaboration, a lot of cooperation between vendors. And if you are like each other's rivals as severe competitor, it's very difficult to pick up the phone and say, hey, this is how I'm going to design the API. Do you want to come along? It's very difficult. I'm very sure it will be difficult for anybody. But it's a big shout out for all of these people, for every one of them. Um, to collaborate upstream and for working on the common API and getting the same solution. So thank you very much for doing that. And the red and the bottom line is it's all accepted upstream. So Red Hat works with anybody who works with upstream, be it the NetDev upstream or DPDK upstream, OVS upstream, which is part of NetDev now. But anyhow, up for open source for us means upstream upstream, not just it's publicly available and you can download. All accepted. This is awesome. This is, this is tremendous. This is tremendous. OK, so again, more background about the PVP test. So there is some blog. There's a very good blog written by Elko. It's on the bottom right. And more testing about, I mean, more information about the PVP testing. Olga was asking me this morning, what, what's PVP? So PVP is our simple test. Frank had a better diagram yesterday. Again, please look at that. That has more information about it. This is a simpler diagram. PVP for us is physical to virtual to physical. So with the, most of the vendors that you saw, this is the test we run. We have made it public. We can share it with anybody. And we'd like all everybody's participation on that also. So this gives a simple-minded diagram. Traffic comes from uh, Xena, which is one of the traffic generators. Or T-Rex goes into the card. Control from there, simple. You guys are more experts on this than I am. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Before I flip to the next slide, again, request, please do not compare numbers with other vendors. That's not the purpose of my talk. My purpose of my talk is to show a lot of good work has been done, and these are just examples. OK, with that said, Netronome. So as you can see, the, do, um, the bottom flat line at the bottom, which is the orange line, that is the software-only solution. So that is OBS DPDK running on X. Excel 710 Intel card, that is the bottom, that is the line with software only solution. It takes a lot of cores, but that is the packet rate. And then the dotted line, that is the, that is, uh, uh, the dotted line, which is really tall dotted line, is the theoretical max for 40G. But Netronome's numbers with hardware offload, you can see the solid blue line. So their performance is almost theoretical or very close to theoretical for most of the numbers, and is definitely, definitely higher than the software-only solution. But that graph on the left, the big graph, is not the key graph. The key graph is on the top right, which shows the CPU consumption. So the killer graph on this slide is the OVS vSwitch CPU utilization. So with the Netronome blue, tiny blue graph, that all that red CPU is relieved. So that is all the impact, all the processing from the motherboard is taken on on the NIC, and the NIC is doing that processing. By the way, there's nothing wrong with Intel. The Intel is a lovely company. We love Intel. <laughs> and they, we want to enforce their business for selling more CPUs. That's awesome. But we would much rather they would sell the CPUs for other purposes, not for network, uh, network uh, forwarding, packet forwarding. So that is one example. The next example is Mellanox. Again, just an example. Please don't compare graph to graph. It doesn't make sense. But the bottom line is, look at how much CPU is relieved, how much motherboard CPU is relieved. Tiny amount of CPU on the motherboard, everything else taken. All that big giant red bar, gone. It's just that tiny amount of blue line 
blue blue CPU that you uh, blue bar that you need for the CPU. Okay, moving along. Uh, flows per second. So you might, somebody might ask, hey, uh, what's up, Rashid? So packet per second is just one aspect of this picture. Flows per second matter also. Yes, sure. So there's, they are scaling. They scale no problem. I'll let you guys read this graph on your own, but they scale, no issue. I'm running a little bit late, so I'm going to rush a little bit. Um, and same thing for Mellanox. Mellanox is working hard. As I said, they have better numbers. These are just example numbers, and we are working with them to make this better, and they have other chips coming out, firmware coming out, so no big deal. But this is Netronome, Mellanox, and so the purpose of my slide so far was just to give an idea that in the last 12 months, working with everybody, it has come along a long, a long way. Ben, Justin, Joe, many different people helped us guide people together. It's come a long way. But as I say often, Rome wasn't built in a day. There's a lot more work to be done, and we have to be honest about it. So there's still a lot of work to be done before it becomes prime time. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's still some big gaps are there. So for example, connection, track, connection tracking is an important feature for OpenStack. Like almost every workload that we know or use case that we know requires connection tracking. On the container side also, uh, at least our OpenShift uh, solution requires connection tracking. So connection tracking offload, it's on the horizon, it's like within a quarter or two, but that needs to come together as well. So that's very important. Then OpenStack integration is very important. So I was talking to some vendors, et cetera, about the firmware update, right? Okay, we deploy it, how will it be firmware? And I said, when you talk about firmware update or driver update, please think of it that the data center is in, I don't know, uh, Saskatchewan or North Dakota. Nobody can get there with a direct flight. There is no USB port, there is no SSH, there is no FTP. So now how will you update? There's no other connection, there's no debug connector that you can put on the card. So it has to be integrated with OpenStack so that OpenStack knows the images, it knows how to reboot the server, it knows where to the, put the images. So integration into upper layers or higher layers is a must have. And that's a little bit difficult for a silicon vendor, I can understand, like why do I have to, my card is here, Red Hat is in the middle, and I have to go talk to some ephemeral thing like OpenStack, and I'm sorry, that is the future, that is the reality we live in. So it's not just OpenStack, but even for Google Cloud, for Azure, for other places, they will have the same problem. Nobody can update your firmware the old way. It has to be integrated at the top of the mountain level. Then the next one, flow insertion, deletion rate improvement, um, expanding to do additional actions. So you can see this, that this is, an, this is a list that me and our team came up with, that this is the to-do list. It's not necessarily in order, but it's also not random. We can talk about this like, okay, you might think that this feature is more important than that, and I would most probably agree with you. But if you have a question about this list, let's talk about it. I'm here for the rest of the day. Um, so we can talk about it and say, Rajesh, why do you think QoS is so low? Yeah, and I can tell you from my perspective. And Frank and others, they are more experts, they are here as well. They'll tell you from their perspective as well. So bottom line, we have come a long way. Hardware offload looks really promising, really promising. I think that that might be the solution to many of the ills that we have right now in the system. And it's awesome. It brings up, it expands the ecosystem. It brings other players into the system. The, the mundane stuff or the same old, same old Gazenta Gazardos, let's offload it into hardware. And let's keep the software more flexible for more important things to do, more creative things. And the boring stuff, let the hardware, silicon, and the cards take care of it. With that said, we are hiring, shameless plug. <laughs> so if uh, you know anybody who's looking, uh, we are hiring, my team is hiring, uh, the CTO's office is hiring, storage is hiring. Uh, so feel free to reach out. There are some other uh, links at the bottom, and my email is there as well. So feel free to reach out, especially if you don't disagree. If you agree, uh, more than welcome to reach out. But if you disagree with any of this, please reach out. We'll talk more. If you are in the Boston area, please feel free to stop by our office. Thank you very much.
All right, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, if you have a question, please come up to one of the mics. Uh, but before we take other people's questions, I, I have one. So um, one of the, the things that always occurs to me when people uh, point out that with uh, 100 gig NICs and so on, uh, that uh, there's, uh, there, there's so few cycles available per packet if, if you want to, uh, to do, do forwarding uh, and, and pass it along to a, another core, it, it seems to me that if that's true, uh, then uh, when the software ultimately wants to actually do something with it at an application level, that you'd, you'd still have uh, almost the same problem. And presumably, the application has a lot more real work to do other than passing it along. So as these speeds get faster and faster, don't, don't we really put at least as much of, a, of pressure on the other software in the system? Isn't, it, mm -hmm. do, do we have any time left to actually do anything with the packet at these rates? I agree with you, Ben. It might not make sense to have a 100 gig card in a server. What is it going to do? Like even if, let's say, the 100 gig takes no cycles, let's say, it's perfect. What are we going to do with that much process? Like what else is it doing? Like how many ultra fast uh, stock transactions do you need that you are going to bring a 100G into the server? I agree with you that that is to be that is to be found out when the applications are written on it and done. But at the same time, our stance is a little bit different. Let's say even for 25G. If for 25G you're taking 16 cores just for getting packets into VMs, that's a lot of cores. So I agree with you. So I don't have a good answer, and I don't have a crystal ball. But I also know that it would make sense to relieve some pressure of the main CPU so that it can do the ultra-fast stock transactions or fast Fourier transforms. OK, I can't disagree with that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad that you don't dis disagree with it. <laughs> well, it might be a more fun discussion if I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, do, do we have a question over here? It's more like a, not a question. It's just answer to the question before. We do have customers that are running software and utilize our 100 gig NICs. So it's even not one NIC, even four NICs. So they have software they're running and, and uh, um, a processing packets with 400 gig. Yes. Do you have a? Can you tell us sort of what class of software that is? What kind of? What? Vira Auto. Okay. Thank you. Cool. There you go. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, you benchmark every smart NIC. So do you think which smart NIC is better? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, where's the trap? Let me see. <laughs> so the question was, we benchmarked some and not a lot, which one is better? <laughs> yes, please ask the hardware vendor. That's a very good answer. Thank you. Please ask the hardware vendors. They'll get you a better answer. No, the thing is that the race is in the middle. In my opinion, if you really ask, we are in the middle of the race. The marathon hasn't been won. The, the, the finish line is way over there. So if... In my assessment is whoever gets to that list that I put out first with decent performance will definitely naturally be the natural winner. Because we are not only doing fast processing, we are relieving. And all of this checklist that everybody talks about, it's also done. Now, next, you know, so that will be the clear winner. So most probably in the next six to nine months, maybe in the next nine months, let's say zero to nine months, the clear leaders will start emerging. So hold that question. Ask me again next year. Cheaper or more expensive than uh, in uh, dollars terms or some other cost? Cost of power? Co I haven't done that math, but I'll tell you that I was surprised when I found out the prices of these smart NICs. Pleasantly surprised. I assume they are in like $10,000, $30,000 range. They are not. I don't know the prices, so I won't even tell you. But I think if you find out about it, you will be also pleasantly surprised at how affordable they are. All right, uh, we're, we're out of time for questions. Uh, I, I'm sure that Rashid would be uh, pleased to, to, to talk to you directly. Uh, uh, let's thank our speaker uh, one more time. Thank you very much.